Columbus. Heartless. Those Reds of the 70s, Pete Rose, the ultimate hustler. Johnny Betts, the game's best catcher. George Foster, the team's prime thumper. And Joe Morgan seemed to be the unquestioned leader. But Tony Perez had many qualities that made him special. It was hard to pigeonhole exactly what he did for the team, except to make it win. Welcome back to Sports of All Sorts. Our salute to Tony Perez on this weekend that is jersey number 24 was permanently retired by the Cincinnati Reds. Tony means a lot to the average baseball fan, but Tony Sims Howell of the Ohio Commission on Hispanic and Latino Affairs said last night at a ceremony how much he means to his race. Tony, I have this resolution for you. I'm not going to read it because of time, but the Hispanic community love you. You're part of us and you will always be. God bless. Thank you. You come over here when you're 17 years old. You don't know the language very well. How scary was that, being a, just a teenager and coming to play baseball? Well, that was scary because uh, the first thing they told you when, you when you come over here, you say, what are you going to do over there? You know, your family, you know, like my, my mother was scared. And she said, what are you going to do over there? You don't, you don't know how to speak English. Uh, are you going to get on that plane? You're going to fly? And, you know, things like that. And, uh, and then when you get on the plane and, and, and you say, uh, I'm going to be there alone, uh, that, you know, it makes you a little shaky. But I want to play baseball. Uh, and and my, the only thing I can, the only opportunity I have is to, to come, over, come over here. Uh, but because I, this is what the, what the real game is, I mean, the big leagues. And, and, uh, and I just say, well, I go and, and do whatever I have to do, you know, to make it to the big leagues. And, uh, and I got a lot of help on my way, and, uh, and I make it. Tell me about your big signing bonus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I ain't getting no bonus, but uh, I got $2.50 uh, $2 for a visa. It's all I know, all I need to, you know, to get on the plane and come down. A lot different than today. Tony Perez came to America and became a big star and a great citizen of baseball. Let's go to our phones and voicemails. Jerry from Villa Hills first up tonight on the phones. Hi, Jerry. Hi, how are you? Okay, what, what did Tony Perez mean to you? Well, Tony and Patuka and the boys were neighbors of ours. In the summer of 1988, we lived over at One Lytle, and they were our neighbors down the hall. And if there was ever a, a family hall of fame, I certainly would put them right there in first. They are just a wonderful family, and we are so proud to have known them. Well, and, and you mentioned Patuka. Uh, we saw her in the ceremony. She is every bit as classy as Tony. Oh, yes, she is. Yes, we feel very privileged to have spent that summer with his neighbors to them, and we congratulate them all. Thank you. Thank you. Eduardo and Victor turned out to be really outstanding young gentlemen. Cliff from White Oak. Hi, Cliff. Yeah, hi. How's it going tonight, Paul? Thanks for calling. Okay. Um, I want to talk about when I remember, shoot, I think it was back in 69, my dad took me to the Crosley Field, and it was bat day, and I got a Tony Perez bat, and uh, playing knot hole at the time, and I treasured it, and um, for some, you know, just because of that, I went ahead and paid attention to his career, and he's always been somebody paying attention to his career, obviously, is a good idea, because he's been a great ball player, and a great man, and somebody we can all respect. Yeah, do you still have the bat? Um, unfortunately, no. No. We're, we're always a lot smarter about 20 years later. Yeah, yeah. I had a Johnny Bench card on my bicycle spokes at one time. <laughs> I understand. Thanks, Cliff. Okay. Let's go to Sydney in Northside. Hi, Sydney. How are you doing tonight, Papa? Okay, thanks for calling. I just wanted to say I, I think the, the highest, uh, Tony Perez, I thought that he carried himself as a class act. I remember as I got older, I always admired uh, Joe Morgan, so I played second. But as I got older, uh, I went to first, and I thought of Tony Perez because of just how he carried himself, and he was clutch. And I never felt that he got the credit that he deserved because he was amongst so many stars. But uh, I felt he got done wrong a couple times, but he just handled himself like the true statesman that he is. And I'm just so thankful that uh, he played for us and I – that he finally got in the Hall of Fame because he deserved it. Sidney, you bring up a good point. I, I heard some people take issue with the fact that he was a great RBI producer. They said, well, when you get Morgan and Rose and uh, these guys in front of him on base, he should drive in runs. But you know something? There are guys around that, that have people on base that setting the table for him, and they still can't drive him in. That's true. That's true. But Tony's a class act, and 
And it's just he's appreciate he he's what the game's all about, and I, I'm just so thankful that uh, he finally got in because he deserved it. Good deal. Thirty-eight thousand agreed with you last night. More coming up with Tony Perez in just a minute. We'll talk about the way he managed to come up with the big hits in the big games. But first, the big game looms in the Ohio baseball tournament tomorrow. That's where the Elder Panthers will play for the regional title and a chance to go to the state final four. To do that, they're going to have to beat their chief rival from the GCL, the Muller Crusaders. The Crusader, or Panthers beat the Crusaders three times during the regular season. Elder and Muller play at Wright State tomorrow. That's at 4 o'clock. Meanwhile, in softball, the Northwest girls fight for a trip to the state softball tournament. They'll play Clayton Northmont for the regional title tomorrow, 1 o'clock, at the University of Dayton. Decide to walk Morgan intentionally and pitch to one of the game's toughest RBI men, Tony Perez. They say he can drive a run in from the clubhouse. And there it is. And here comes the winning run. Three straight playoff games, two straight series games. Munson tells it all for the Yankees. While the Cincinnati Reds tell the world, we're still Reds hot. You know, there are some guys that have good batting averages, but don't hit with guys on base. You had a good average, and you hit with guys on base, and you got the big hits. Have you ever looked at that and said, what made me able to deliver the clutch hit? Well, I know. I, I think uh, the way I played the game was to win. And, and to win, you had to score runs. And, and to score runs, you had to have somebody who drove in the runs. And, uh, and I always feel that way. I always feel since the minor league, I feel like that guy, that guy who, who can go out there, you know, and, and love to hit with men on bases. And, and I was lucky enough or, or had the ability to do it and, and you know, come up on that time. And, and that was great. I mean, that was great because I knew I can do it. And plus, uh, you know, when you play uh, with Pete and, and, and Griffey and, and, and Morgan, you had to draw him in because he'd be, they'd be all over me for I left him out there. And they let you know it when you do it. They let me know it, and I, I really don't want that to happen. Thanks for joining us uh, on this salute to Tony Perez on Sports of All Sorts tonight. Last night, the Cincinnati Reds retired Perez's number 24. Chief Operating Officer John Allen did the honors. What a night. But on behalf of the entire Cincinnati Reds organization, it, it is our honor to retire number 24, never to be worn again by a Cincinnati Red. And in honor of this occasion, we have a replica that I'd like to present to Tony at this time. Please turn your attention to the left field wall. There was a bit of a controversy here about Ken Griffey Jr. wanting that number. Did he come to you and, uh, you know, what, what were your feelings about whether that number should be retired or unretired? Well, I think um, I'm in the Hall of Fame and, uh, and after I got in the Hall of Fame, I think the, the number should be retired because uh, all the other numbers out there on the wall are, are the guys on the Hall of Fame and, and I would like to be there and uh, it's not nothing with Junior. I, I love Junior. I saw him raise up and... Uh, and I follow his career, and it's been great, and, uh, I, I'm, and I'm proud he won to my and the number, but, uh, you know, the circumstances, uh, I want the number uh, retired, but I talked to him uh, before spring training. He asked me, and I told him, hey, Junior, I, I want my number retired. I'm in the Hall of Fame now. And, uh, he understands. He says, uh, okay, uh, I understand, and I wore my daddy's number. Say good. I mean, uh, and that was it. I never talked to him again. 
Number 24 now hangs on the left field wall along with the numbers of Johnny Bench, Frank Robinson, Ted Klazuski, Joe Morgan, and Fred Hutchinson. Back to the phones. Let's go to David and Falmouth. No, no, no. Let's go to Donna in Deer Park. Hi, Donna. Hi. How are you tonight? Fine. How are you doing? Okay. Thanks for calling. Um, I was just calling when I was about eight years old. Um, I had gone to Kings Island with um, my family, and Dave, uh, Tony Perez and Dave Concepcion were both at Kings Island with their families, and they took time out to um, for autographs, uh, and I still have the autographs that they had both of them had done, and they took time out for photographs with us. So it was something that was really neat, and it's something I could that I have that I can still show my children. Yeah, and, and some guys out in public like that would rather not be bothered, but it sounds like they took the time with you. Yes, they definitely did. It was very nice. And it's been a long time, but I'm still, you know, still able to remember. Um, and it was really neat, so. Very good. Th Donna, thanks for calling tonight. Thanks. Okay, let's go to Mike in North College Hill. Hi, Mike. Hi, Papa. How are you? Okay, thanks for staying up late. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what, other, other than the, uh, the home run in the 15th inning off of Catfish, uh, that was a great, you know, uh, highlight of his career and as well as it was kind of fun watching it on TV. But uh, in person, that old Crosley in 1969, the amazing Mets were in town for a twinite doubleheader. And uh, there was a young fireballer by the name of Nolan Ryan out there pitching the second game of the twinite, and he was just mowing everybody down except for Perez and I clearly remember him whacking two doubles off of the left wall out there and I just just knew then that uh, you know Tony is uh, definitely uh, uh, top of the line as far as a fastball hitter and uh, he was just uh, just couldn't it was tough to get anything by him yeah you know there, there's something about certain guys that you know they come up and they play their best when when it's on the line uh -huh. and you know you know other guys shrink away from that sort of thing Yes. Yes, and I'm really glad that uh, to see uh, Tony. Uh, di that's Tony's number, number 24. I'm glad to see it on the left field wall. You got it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Let's go to Michael in Pierce Township. Uh, how are you, Michael? Good evening, Papa. Hi. Boy, you need about two or three more hours to cover this. Well, maybe we'll just preempt uh, George Michael and keep on with this. It sounds good to me. Um, golly, um, Patuka and Tony moved when they first came to the Reds into Mount Lookout, and I was still living at home and young boy and, you know, very gracious, fine people then. And how do you follow a guy's career? Uh, seems like clutch time after clutch time. 1970, I think it was, where it was either 70 or 75, where he had 70 RBIs by the All-Star break. I remember that, yeah. Um, literally carried the team. And then I guess one of the best highlights for me had to be um, – when the Reds honored Tony when he retired, my wife and I went to the final game, and he smacked a home run in his final game. I mean, it was typical Tony Perez, clutch time. You know, there were so many good players on that team. What, what, do, you, what do you make of why he was so popular? Because it's it said that even when other players might have gotten booed, Tony Perez never got booed here. Um, a very rare word these days, humility. Mm -hmm. um, here's a man who obviously came from an oppressed society who was uh, grateful for the opportunity to play a game that he loved um, and just displayed it constantly, uh, his gratitude when he came to the plate. I think humility, obviously something that's lacking these days. Yeah, that's exactly right. Good deal. Thank you. More coming up in just a minute. We talk with Tony about playing with the Big Red Machine and wonder why it took so long to make it to Cooperstown. But first, it was 65 years ago this week that Cincinnati fans were reading about the first baseball game played at night at Crosley Field. And this week at the Cincinnati Museum Center, the lights were lit at a model of Crosley Field, part of the Cincinnati in Motion exhibit in Cincinnati in miniature from the 30s and 40s. You can enjoy the Big Red Machine at your breakfast table now. A new box of flakes is out with Four Hall, three Hall of Famers, Tony Perez, Johnny Bench, and Joe Morgan, and one should-be Hall of Famer, Pete Rose, on the front of the box. We're talking about Tony Perez and the Big Red Machine tonight on Sports of All Sorts, and we're inviting your calls, 6210999, and emails about the Big Dog. He was one of the most confident members of that great baseball team. I watched with a great team mm -hmm. in the 70s, and we knew every time we walk on the field, we're going to win. And... Uh, uh, I got traded and I went to a team with not that the same way and I knew we don't have the same opportunity to win ball game, but I tried every day 
to win a ball game and made the other guy feel the same way, you know, because they were younger. Uh, you know, when I went to Montreal, it was the same way. It was a last place team. Well, in two years, uh, we fight for first place, you know, because uh, those guys got the, the feeling they can win ball games. In the clubhouse, Tony Perez had a lot to say on that team. In public, he was a lot less vocal. But last night, he was happy to speak. This is the hard part now. Everybody here know how I feel. How I feel for Cincinnati, for you fans, for the city, for the ball club. I want to thank everybody. Thank the Cincinnati Red for this day, for retire my number, and be there with five other great players. Thank you. Cincinnati, you friend, you're the greatest. I love you. Thank you. Saturday night at the ballpark, number 24 was retired. Let's go out to Ed in Cincinnati. Hi, Ed. How you doing, Pablo? Thanks for calling. Well, thank you. I, I just want to commend you and uh, also Joe Webb uh, on the work that you do. I appreciate both of you. Thank you. But uh, talking about Tony, uh, as soon as I found out when he was retiring, I uh, made sure and got some tickets myself and uh, had a great time at the game last night. Uh, uh, even though it's not in our budget this year, uh, when I found out that he was going in the Hall of Fame uh, along with another classy individual, Sparky, uh, I'm going to make the trip up to Cooperstown this year and uh, looking really, really forward to it. Yeah, how are you going up? Are you just going up on your own or going with like a tour group? No, I'm going with a couple of individuals, one fellow that uh, works at the hospital at uh, my place of employment and then an, also another friend, uh, and we're going to uh, fly up to Albany, rent a car, drive in, and spend a three-day weekend there and, uh, of course, be there for the induction and then leave Sunday night and come back. Have you been there before? Never have. No, you uh, won't regret I'm, it. Uh, I'm 53 years old. I'm uh, like a little kid when I think of things like that, and uh, it's something along with spring training or two things I've always wanted to do in my life, and uh, uh, my lovely wife has been gracious enough to uh, back me on this and uh, sort of prompt me, not that I need it much. but. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason I ask whether you're going with a group, I get a, uh, this question on email. Hey, Popo, do you have any information on chartered bus trips to Cooperstown for Cincinnati fans who want to see Tony's induction? Uh, Laura, I don't have that information, but maybe somebody watching might have that kind of information. And please call us at 6210999 if you have any information on charter trips going up to Cooperstown uh, in July. Let's go to Tony in Mount Healthy. Hi, Tony. Yes, how are you, Papa? Okay. That's good. Um, my greatest experience uh, knowing uh, Tony Perez, I worked there as a vendor in 1972 through 1975, and, uh, and we used to go down after we finished to the clubhouse and and Tony and his family always made you feel as though you knew him in a, in a personal way he'd always smile and wave at you he and his wife and so that, that had a tremendous effect on me and my family because I would take those stories uh, back to my brother Michael and he and we would play and he would bat just like Tony Perez and and anytime uh, Tony Perez would come back to Cincinnati later on uh, it, it would always move our hearts. So Tony was the type of player who, who could touch your heart. Yeah, that's exactly right. But, you know, and he didn't have to know your name. He knew that you were interested in seeing him. And, you know, he was never one of those guys to brush you off. Correct. And, and so and, uh, that's one of our greatest experiences in our families. And we will always treasure knowing Tony Perez. Good deal. Thanks, Tony. Take care. So why was so much fan support and teammate support that it take nine years for Perez to make it to the Hall of Fame? There are different theories, but you have to think Johnny Bench is one of the best. I think the one thing that hurt Tony was he went, when he went to the American League. And I think a lot of American League writers saw him, and they saw him not like we saw him, uh, you know, in the National League. And I think you're, you're expecting a lot of people to vote. Half the people it should be balanced, I assume. Half the people in the American League to, sh to vote for Tony Perez. And I, I just so think they saw Tony not in the same kind of light, not the same kind of player that he was for all the years that he was in this city and also in, in Philadelphia. 
and he always was the backup guy. I mean, when you think didn't win a most valuable player, but how can you? I mean, with, with Pete and Joe and, and myself, and you know, how could you? Uh, it's like, you know, gold gloves. Uh, Gary Carter didn't get a lot of votes this time, and I was sort of surprised at that. But he didn't, you know, he won two or three gold gloves more than Fisk, or he won three compared to two. But how could he win a gold glove during those years? I mean, there's just sometimes there's restrictions on who gets it. But I think Tony was hurt by that and hurt by the fact that maybe Cepeda wasn't in. And he didn't have 500 home runs and a lot of things. But to look at the complete package, Tony Perez is a Hall of Famer. And right now, uh, he doesn't care. He doesn't care about all those other years. He's, he's in the Hall of Fame. Makes it, maybe it makes it even sweeter. Let's go to Dale in Redding. Hi, Dale. Hi, Papo. How are you tonight? Pretty good. Well, I found this memory of Tony is Marty's first year of broadcasting, mm -hmm. and the Reds were playing the Giants in the first game of a doubleheader, and the Reds were losing 13-9. And when you know it, Tony hit a two-run homer in the bottom of the ninth to win it 14-13 off Randy Moffin, I think it was, because <laughs> I got the tape that Kroger had a long time ago. Right. And there's Marty doing that call on part of that history. And it just gave me goosebumps listening to Marty call it not knowing that that's my fondest memory of Tony Plus. And you were there? Yep. Yeah. Blue seats, and then first, and then another memory, make it short but sweet, he was at a baseball card show up at Muller High School, and he signed a poster of mine from Sports Illustrated in 1960, or 1970, the Reds were still playing at Crosley, and he signed it, and I framed it next to Pete's pinstripe uniform and from Sports Illustrated. <laughs> you know, two foot by three foot posters. And sure. You know, I treasure that and got my picture shaking Tony's hand, and I'll never forget that one either. You know, so well, he, that's... He but, carries some special memories then. Yep. Thanks. Big red machine, long live forever. You got it. Thanks, Dale. Okay. Thanks, More to Papa. come in just a minute. That's when we'll talk with Tony about being traded and being fired. But first, back to the ballpark today where it was photo day for the Reds of 2000. Fans were lined up in big numbers at mid-morning to make their way into the ballpark for a snapshot of their favorite Reds. They sure couldn't get close. It's a big barriers up, but with a zoom lens, you can still get a picture and a memory. For a period of time, as we're trying to diagnose why this team was playing as poorly as they were, uh, we have a lot of talented people on this, on this team, a lot of proven veterans that were not getting the job done. And certainly all of the blame for losing does not go to Tony Perez and to the coaches. Uh, I accept blame, the organization accepts the blame, but we needed to make a change. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that, ma'am. We're, we're taking all the complaints uh, and passing them along. 1993, when Tony Perez was fired as Reds manager, after only 44 games, the switchboard lit up. Mm -hmm. Many fans were telling the operators they wouldn't be coming back to the stadium. As bad as that was, it wasn't as bad as October of 1976, right after the Reds had won their second straight World Series, Perez was called into the front office by general manager Bob Housem and was told he probably would be traded. He, when Bob Housem told you he was going to trade you, um, how shocking was that or was it disappointing? Well, I was, it, was, it was hard. It was hard because he called me in the office and he says for the, for the right trade, for the right thing come up, I, my, they might trade me because I, they got a, a younger guy, Dreesing, uh, who was ready to play. It was true, he was ready to play. Um, and I say, uh, well, it's okay. And the only thing I asked him was, well, can you trade me to a contender team? And uh, he says, uh, he says, uh, Tony, you can make any anything a contender. I said, well, why you want to get rid of me then? You know that that's uh, what he said. Yeah, that's the, you know, I was kidding. And then there was the fun part of it. But uh, it was hard to leave Cincinnati. That was hard. And when you see uh, that day when I come back here and. Uh, uh, see Johnny and uh, he was feel bad about it and, and that was that was emotional and that was something I never forget the way Johnny feels that day when uh, when we met in uh, Ruben Katz's office and uh, he he brought, brought me that was that was very emotional because it was all about friends too right right you know it's like if somebody like your brother leaving or something going somewhere I think yeah. I've talked to Bob, you know, me and Bob talk about housing. We probably talk at least every three weeks. And uh, I talked to him the other day again, and we always talk about the mistake both of us made uh, when we traded Tony. 
Yet another Reds Hall of Famer, Sparky Anderson, who will freely admit, along with Bob Housem, that they underestimated how much Tony Perez meant to the Big Red Machine. They didn't know it until he was gone. Let's go out to Dave in Hamilton. Hi, Dave. Hey, Papa. How you doing? Okay. Thanks for calling in. Well, my favorite memory of Tony is he's always been one of my favorite Reds players. But when he got traded and then eventually got traded back to the Reds, I used to listen as a teenager to the Reds all the time. And it seemed like when they traded him back, even in his eldest years, every game I listened to as a teenager, he wouldn't play. And they'd put him in as a pinch hitter late in the games. And it seemed like every time he would come through with the clutch hit. It didn't matter who they played or what, what game it was. He would come through every time. And he, even his old his eldest years, he would still come through. And that still rings true today. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, you could see why the Expos wanted him, the Red Sox wanted him, the Marlins then wanted him as a coach because he was a great influence to those people around him. He just knew how to, how to get through in those critical moments of the games, how to teach them kids and everything, and just in them critical points of the game to come through every time. And I'll never forget that about Tony. He definitely deserves to be in the Hall of Fame among those great players. Good deal. Thanks for calling in from Hamilton, Dave. Let's go to Terry in Newport. Hi, Terry. How you doing? Okay, what's up? It's kind of funny everybody's mentioning double headers tonight on Sundays, and we don't hear those no more. Well, how, how, about, how about this? Is Remember what Memorial Day used to mean? A oh, double yeah. header. You used my, to go to a picnic and turn on the radio and listen to two games. My fondest memory is I was, oh, who knows how old I was. I was young. I was sitting, I remember I was sitting in the very last row of the red seats behind home plate. Now, that's way up there. But the place was sold out on a Sunday doubleheader against the Dodgers. I don't know if it was 75 or 76, mm -hmm. but going into the doubleheader that day, the Reds were out of first place by one game. And Bench was hurt. And remember Hal King? Oh, yeah. He come in and played for, I don't know, what, about three or four games, and he hit a home run in the first game to win it. Mm -hmm. Second game, they was losing by two or three runs. Two outs in the bottom of the ninth inning. Who comes up to the plate? The dog. Mm -hmm. Everybody in that stadium knew that he was going to win it, and he hit a home run dead over the 404 marker in center field to end it and take first place that night. Yeah. That's my fondest memory. And that was a great rivalry in those days. Oh, that was Reds and favorite. Dodgers. I mean, really two outstanding teams. And that was it. 50-something thousand people in the stands. Yeah. All right. Good deal. Glad you got that memory. Interesting combination of hitter. He had better than average power, but he also hit for a solid average. And he did so with a great deal of consistency, which is why year after year, he was among the National League leaders in runs batted in. Uh, let me ask you a couple home runs you hit. One, you hit the first Red Cedar at Riverfront Stadium. Do you remember that at all in 1970? Oh, yeah. Oh, you never forgot things like that. I remember. I remember it was... Uh, against uh, Jim McAndrew, you know, the Mets, and uh, it was a grand slam, too. Uh, I remember. Game seven of the 75 World Series, Bill Lee gives you, I guess, an EFIS pitch or a blooper pitch. Did you expect it? Well, I, I know he had it because he threw it to me a couple of times before, and uh, the first time I swing and the ball bounced, and I swing, and that was, that was funny. I think it was funny. Uh, embarrassing at the same time, but he threw it to me again and uh, later, and I took it. But I, you know, I just read it and, and I said, "Well, he threw it again. I might, I might hit it hard somewhere." And he did. And I knew when he stopped on his delivery and stop and throw, I know what's coming though. Let me back to the final segment of our sports of all sorts. Salute to Tony Perez in just about two months. Tony Sparky Anderson, Marty Brenneman, and 19th century standout Big McPhee will be inducted into the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Channel 9 will be there with complete coverage all that weekend. By the way, one of Tony's best friends in baseball, Lee May, the big bopper, got behind the plate last night and caught the pitch as Tony threw out the first ball before the Reds-Marlins game. Perez and May made their way up through the minor league system together. Phones and emails uh, continue. Let's go to Roger in Price Hill. Hi, Roger. How you doing, Papa? Okay. I have a memorial day here. Thanks. Hey, uh, you know, it's uncanny how you mentioned the Bill Lee thing. I've had that in mind uh, that I, I, you know, I remember watching that game. Uh, but I, my grandfather told me a story once about Tony Perez hitting a ball to Dayton. 
He actually hit it out of Crosley Field and went in the back of a pickup truck <laughs> on 75, and they drove all the way up to Dayton with the ball. Uh, uh, I remember uh, the, uh, it seemed like he hit more home runs off in the center field than any, any part of the park. It, it seems like his, his uh, jersey should be uh, up, up in the center field somewhere there, you know. Uh, but the Billy pitch, um, I remember that, that blob pitch, the blooper. Uh, Seaver pitched that, that pitch. Uh, I think uh, Pedro Babone had that pitch. But uh, I, he struck out uh, Perez twice on that pitch in that World Series, uh, the 75 against uh, Boston Red Sox. And then uh, I remember Kurt Galley saying, uh, you know, he, he threw that ball. He didn't step back to get out of the way of the pitch because it looked like it was going to hit you. And he clobbered it. He knocked it <laughs> a big the green monster and over the screen and everything. But, uh, we I all felt good. bad for Kurt County, too, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. That, was, that's <laughs> that Boston else. Red Sox fan. Yeah, this, this is, a, this is a, a real good tribute to Tony, and I, I, I'm really happy to be a part of this. Uh, uh, I know you said you're going to send this to him, yeah. and uh, uh, he, he's one of my favorite all times. Red with a big red machine, and when they traded him to all, it was like they was running on eight cylinders when they had him, and it was only on seven when they when when he left. And uh, I really appreciate uh, having time to talk to you tonight, Papa. And have a good night. Thanks, Roger. You too. Have a nice Memorial Day, Ellen in Wyoming. Hi, Ellen. Yes, um, and there were so many highlights of his career. And the one low life, which was just mentioned, I was just broken hearted when he was traded. And I know there were people who said, oh, well, you know, his days come and gone. And I said, he is the heart and soul of that team. I think he added so much in the clubhouse and to his uh, camaraderie with his teammates and the younger players. And I think it was a tremendous loss when they traded him. Um, I don't know what his numbers were. Uh, after he left, but um, I think his clutch hitting was much more important than that. Oh, I think he played almost another 10 seasons. He played till I think he was 43 years old. So yeah, he wasn't exactly over the hill. <laughs> no, and he, he's like uh, like one of the earlier callers said, he could still come up with a big hit too. Yes. Ellen, thanks very much for calling. Uh huh. Um, Gina Kaniga writes: As a young girl, my father faithfully listened to the Reds on radio. The Tony Perez quote that will always be in the back of my mind was one that he made during a star of the game interview. My family cannot hear Tony's name without saying, Victor, he liked me to hit the long ball. I think, she, I think that's probably how she uh, wanted to, he, oh, Victor, he likes me to hit the long ball. Good. Dave Master says, hey, Popo, I wore number 24 from the time I played knothole all through high school and even when I played softball. So I think you get the idea who will be my all-time favorite player. Also, uh, our producer Jake Jolivet points out to me, Provident Travel has a four-day bus trip or a one-day flight up to Cooperstown for the Hall of Fame. So whoever uh, from Provident Travel gave us a call, thanks very much for uh, including that information. Let's go to Eric in Richwood. Hi, Eric. Hello, John. Thanks for calling. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one memory I have is when Tony was with uh, Montreal. I still have a poster in a drawer somewhere around here. When Pete got hit number 3,000, uh, there was Tony there playing first to uh, greet him. Tony was the first man to reach a hand out and give Pete a hug. And uh, you could tell that you know, there was a lot of love there. And uh, even though they were on different teams, they were still like brothers. And uh, I'll always remember that big grin on Tony's face when, uh, when Pete was you know, rounding the bag and uh, holding there with a single. And uh, another thing I remember, uh, a sportscaster, I think it was uh, Joe Garagiola, one time said, uh, Tony very rarely argued a call. Mm -hmm. But when, uh, when Tony did argue a call, you knew that the umpire had blown it and that, uh, you know, Tony was right. If he, uh, if he thought it was questionable, he wouldn't open his mouth. But when, when you knew that he did argue it, you, you knew Tony was right and that umpire was wrong. Good deal. And th the last thing I'd like to say is, uh, you know, everybody around here loves Tony, just uh, not so much as, as the great player, I think more because he's just such a great man. And, uh, uh, and that says it all right there. Eric, I have to go. That's the story from 5th and Central tonight. Thanks, as always, for being a big part of our show. For producer Jake Jolivet and chief telephone screener Mike Cannell, I'm John Popovich. Good night, everyone. Hi, Chris. You know, dancing.